When it comes to the people of the Indian subcontinent, there's a lot of debate and misunderstanding when discussing the ancestors of these populations. What makes the modern day South Asian? What is the genetic difference between a Kashmiri and a Tamil, and a Bengali and a Baluchi? There is many misconceptions on the genetic history of South Asia as well. What is an Aryan? What is a Dravidian? I have literally seen people say, well, I'm a Dravidian, therefore I'm indigenous, or I'm an Aryan, therefore I'm superior. Or people say, well, X ethnic group are Dravidians that mix with Aryans, and that's why they look like that. Well, no, that's not how it works at all. Both Indo-Aryan and Dravidian are just cultural linguistic terms, and when we look at the prehistoric populations that make up these groups, they are the descendants of the same people, just with different rates of these ancestries depending on the region, ethnicity, and even caste. I'll make a more in-depth video about the whole Aryan and Dravidian topic another time, but today I will go over the populations and migrations that created the modern South Asian genome. Who are the ancient ancestors of South Asians? Well first, there are two terms you need to understand before going into the specific groups that migrated into South Asia to create the modern South Asian, and that is East Eurasian and West Eurasian. East Eurasian refers to the descendants of the first people to enter and settle into what we would now define as the eastern part of the landmass of Eurasia. Groups with high rates of East Eurasian DNA would be most East Asians, Southeast Asians, but also Australian Aboriginals, the ethnic groups native to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, like the Sentinelese, also Melanesians, Samoans, and also an ancient group referred to as the AASI, or South Asian hunter-gatherers. The second term is West Eurasian. This is the groups that developed in the western part of the landmass of Eurasia. From the British, to Afghans, to Swedes, to Amazir, these are people that develop certain features like lighter skin, more body hair, lighter eyes, However, this isn't standard throughout all West Eurasian descendants or just limited to West Eurasians. Both of these groups ended up in South Asia through different migrations and make up South Asian DNA. The first migrations into the Indian subcontinent happened around 60,000 years ago. This group would be referred to as the AASI, Ancient Ancestral South Indian, also known as the South Asian hunter-gatherers, for obvious reasons. They hunted and gathered in South Asia. They had darker skin, a skinnier frame, most likely curly to straight hair, and broader facial features like slightly wider noses and fuller lips. In South Asians, this genetic component is on average 40% of South Asian DNA, but this can depend on the group. A Punjabi Jat may only have 20% of this DNA, whereas a Bengali or a Tamil might have 50-55% to of this DNA. The ethnic groups with the highest rates of these ancestries are actually Austroasiatic speaking Munda groups in northern India, like the Karya or Gon, with these groups having around 75% of their DNA coming from the AASI, with a quite noticeable Southeast Asian component as well, which makes sense because the Austroasiatic languages do originate in Southeast Asia. Lower castes of most ethnic groups tend to have higher rates of AASI DNA than higher castes. South Indian Dalits have a 60-70% to 70 AASI DNA component. I'll speak about why this is in another video, as higher castes like Brahmins also have higher rates of West Eurasian related DNA compared to other people within the same ethnic groups. Around 10,000 years ago, there was another migration into South Asia bringing West Eurasian DNA from a region in western Iran called the Zagros Mountains. It is debated on whether or not these Zagros Mountain migrations were Zagros farmers or Zagros hunter-gatherers, as these were very closely related groups. And many claim that the Indus River Valley civilization was a mix between AASI and Iranian hunter-gatherers rather than farmers. This Zagros Mountain DNA component is actually quite high in other regions too, like the Middle East. These farming populations eventually led to the more widespread sedentary villages in South Asia, as agriculture did all over the world. These two groups intermingled and mixed over the next few thousand years and gave way to the modern South Asian phenotype. 
Around three and a half to 4,000 years ago, there was another major migration into South Asia, and this was the migration of the Indo-Aryans. Although the Aryan invasion has been debunked, it is a genealogical fact that there was a migration of a group that we now refer to as the Indo-Aryans into South Asia from Central Asia. The Indo-Aryans were descendants of the original Indo-Europeans, the Proto-Indo-European speakers of the Pontic Caspian Steppe in Southeastern Europe. The Indo-Aryans brought with them a foreign language and a foreign belief system that was tied with their Indo-European ancestors. The language that they spoke was an ancestor of Sanskrit, which became the ancestor of all modern-day Indo-Aryan languages, spoken predominantly in the northern half of the Indian subcontinent by over a billion people today, which means that Punjabi or Bajpuri or Marathi are more closely related to English or Swedish or Italian or Farsi than they are to Tamil or Malayalam. This is a linguistic relationship and not really a genetic one. An Indo-Aryan speaker is much more closely related to a Dravidian speaker than they ever will be with a Germanic speaker. The Indo-Aryans also brought with them spiritual and religious beliefs that mixed with the native beliefs of the region and gave way to modern day Dharmic religions. This is why there is a connection between the ancient Indo-European religion and its descendant religions from Greek and Roman mythology to Norse paganism to Hinduism. Many of the gods of these religions are actually the same gods that just changed over time. Northwest Indians have the highest rate of this Indo-Aryan ancestry with the percentage going down the more southeast you go from that region. West Eurasian DNA in general is higher the more northwest you go. Which makes sense as this is the general direction that West Eurasian DNA was introduced into South Asia. These aren't the only ancestral components in South Asia, of course. One look at Northeast Indians will tell you they have higher rates of DNA more closely related to modern Southeast or East Asians than they do with brown South Asians. But for the majority of South Asians, this isn't a large genetic component. East Indian groups like Bengalis or Assamese will have this East Asian related admixture and so will Munda groups. But in general in South Asia, this Southeast Asian or East Asian admixture is higher closer to the Himalayas or closer to Southeast or East Asia. People will also use terms like ASI or ANI when speaking of South Asian ancestry. Both of these groups are descendant populations of these prehistoric migrations. They themselves are mixed groups. ANI or Ancestral North Indians were a people that were mixed between the Zagros Mountain Farmers and that Indo-Aryan steppe ancestry. Whereas ASI or Ancestral South Indians were a mix of Zagros Mountain Farmers and the AASI or Ancient Ancestral South Indians. The residents of the Indus River Valley civilization were the direct ancestors of the ASI and it is believed that the descendants of the Indus River Valley civilization migrated south, deeper into South Asia, where they mixed more with AASI populations, creating the ASI genome. People use the term ANI and ASI when doing genetic studies as well. It just represents a later time period as more mixing happened after the prehistoric farmer and hunter-gatherer populations had already settled in South Asia. The genetic history of South Asia is far more complex than simplistic narratives about Aryans and Dravidians suggest. Modern South Asians are the result of multiple waves of migration and admixture with varying degrees of East Eurasian and West Eurasian ancestries depending on geography, ethnicity, and caste. South Asian ancestry is highly regionalized with groups in different areas showing different levels of these ancient components. Understanding this history requires moving beyond colonial era misconceptions and recognizing the deep, shared ancestry that unites South Asians rather than divides them.